Amen? Glory to God. So if you're here for the first time, we certainly welcome you. We hope that you enjoyed the song service, the worship service. We like to just usher the presence of the Lord in here. Amen. Our children can be dismissed. Glory, glory, glory. And we are in a series, our fifth week, Freedom from Emotional Pain. How many are finding your deliverance through the series? Amen. Amen. Just three people. Amen. Amen. What we touched on last week was that emotional pain can cause you to stay stuck in life. Right? right? Wherever era your emotional pain is deriving from, that's usually where you're, where you're at. You're going nowhere, you're doing nothing. Every day, every month, every year, it seems to be the same thing. We blame people, we blame things, but the problem is we're not emotionally strong enough to handle life. Amen. Life has done a job on us. It beat us up. It sucked the fight out of us. Emotionally, we can't handle it no more, so we just check out and we just go through life. We go to work, we come home. We come home, we go to the show. We come home, we go to work. We eat, we sleep, and we get up, and we do it all over again. My Bible tells me life's for the living. Now, you could be doing all those things, and you could still be full of life. But you could be doing those things and have the life of God sucked out of you, complaining about, oh, my God, I got to go to work. No, you get to go to work. There's a lot of people that don't have a job that wish they had a job. Oh, I got to clean my house. Live under a bridge and see how happy you are to clean your house. See, when, when, when life is sucked out of you, you take the pleasure out of everything. There is pleasure, believe it or not, pleasure out of cleaning the house. I got a thing about floors. I'm over it a little bit. But it used to be that, you know, every time I cleaned the floors, I'd look at my wife and say, ain't that the best it's ever been? And it was because it was better than the time before. I had to scrub them and scrub them and scrub them. I just got to think about floors. I enjoyed cleaning my floors. Don't look at me like that. I saw progress. Where there was dirt and grime, I fixed it. That made me happy. Then there was times I complained, man, nobody in the house does this but me. I am so sick of this. Wait till they come home. I'm going to get on them for doing it. Don't they see they spilled something and didn't wipe it up? Leaves a ring and I got to scrub it. Lost my pleasure and my joy doing it because their inconsistencies or lack of consideration robbed me and I had just had to function to do the job instead of enjoying the job. It's true anyhow. Have you ever wondered if God is so powerful and almighty and all-knowing, why do bad things happen to you? Why do tragic things happen? I mean, if he's God, why, do trage why does tragedy happen to us? Why are bad things happening if he's God? If he's such a good God, and we hear that he is a good God, and he is a good God. It makes you wonder sometimes. For the most part, Christians go to churches and their problems are minimized where they feel like there's something seriously wrong with them or they're preached a good-to message that means absolutely nothing to their deliverance and their hope. When you come to the house of God, it ought to be about liberation. It ought to be about freedom. And one of the things that God has empowered you and I with, the ability to bring liberation to somebody. And the enemy knows that. That's why he gets so many of us caught up in emotional bondage so that we can't help somebody else be liberated. Can we turn the AC off, please? Off. Yes, I see people putting jackets on. Amen. We have preached a sermon that is self-centered and self-absorbing rather than realize that 
rather than accepting a gospel of surrender and servanthood. A gospel of, uh, of servanthood and surrendering is not accepted today. Everybody wants to hear about, you know, you know give and be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and rolling over. God wants you prosperous. You'd be the head and not the tail. Amen. Well, the Bible says whoever's going to be great in the kingdom must first of all be a servant to all. A servant to all. So, but we can't do that joyfully. We can't do that consistently because we're caught up in our emotional baggage and our emotional bondage. Freedom from emotion is a lifetime, uh, uh, from your emotional bondage, is a lifetime journey. You're not going to hear one message, Who I'm free. It's something that, you know, every time you think you're free, the Holy Spirit will bring something else to surface. And say, man, I thought I was over that. Turn to the person next to you and look at them. Look at the other person. Can you believe that God anointed that person to bring you Freedom. I mean, really look at them. If you're saying, yeah, you need to look again. Because I look in the mirror, and I have to tell myself, God anointed me to bring freedom. And I look again, and I go, God, are you sure? And here's one of the things. If you don't know it, you can never do it. You'll never, and before you do it, and, 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 and this is one of the worst things about Christianity that among anything else. The moment we hear a message, you want to run around and give it to somebody else. Sit on it for a moment. Chew on it for a moment. Think about it for a moment. See if it fits you first. In other words, the scripture says, physician, heal everybody else first. Huh? Get everybody else fixed first. No, fix yourself. Turn your Bibles over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. That we are anointed, or 1 Corinthians, no, second. We are anointed to bring hope, peace, and comfort to anybody that's in need. Anybody. Why is not this the primary focus of the church of Jesus Christ today? Because too many of us are caught up in emotional bondage. Too many of us are caught up with the emotional destruction that's carried us from the past. And let me tell you something. If you think that accepting Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, and running up to the altar and saying, I confess, and all your problems are wiped away, you are sadly mistaken. It's the beginning of your freedom. Now you're in the fight of your life. We are our worst enemy. We quit when we shouldn't quit. We lay down when we shouldn't lay down. We sit down. We quit singing when we shouldn't quit singing. And I'll tell you something. Somebody's depending on you to get this. If you don't get it, somebody's going to die without hope. Somebody's going to die without Jesus. Somebody's going to die in the oppression, the depression that they're in. And the Bible says that their blood is required and it'd be on our hands. There is too much blood on the hands of the saints today because we're not standing up. And I'm not saying testifying, being the example to men and women of the freedom that we can experience in Christ. Because I'll tell you something, before somebody listens to what you're saying, they're reading your life. They're watching you how you act with your children. They're watching you how you act with your wife. They're watching you how you act under pressure. And somebody that is emotionally free, has a sound mind, and can handle the circumstances, the trials, the tributes of life with integrity. Without that, we're slipping and sliding. Without that, we're lying. Without that, we're making excuses. That wipes out much of the church of Jesus Christ today. That that, that doesn't gnaw them? No, not at all. There is always time to get it right. You may have been going to church half your life and got it wrong. Don't think because you're coming to church, hey, man, hallelujah, I got it. When I many times I thought I was right and the Holy Spirit showed me I was wrong. That's a shock. Because we never think we're wrong. Right? But God, but God, but God, nothing. Submit and surrender. Chapter 1, verse 3, 4. What's it say? That we are able to comfort them who comforts and consoles and encourages us in every tribulation, calamity, and affliction. And how many of them? In every one of our problems, he brings comfort to us. So that, listen to this, so that we, put your name in there, can bring comfort to somebody else. 
You can't do it unless you've first been comforted of your problems. I'm talking about an incestuous relationship or, 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 or action, I should say. I'm talking about a rape. I'm talking about abuse, physical, mental, spiritual abuse. He says you can be emotionally free from that. You don't have to be tied to that in your past. Abandonment issues. I'm talking to men and women today that are grown, got children, have grandchildren, are still suffering from abandonment issues. You can be comforted from that so that you can be free. See, we're too busy looking for, I want, I, you know, I just want to be happy. I don't want to be happy. I want to be made whole. Being made whole means I have a sound mind. The things of the past, present, or the future don't, uh, do, does not deter my response to circumstances in life. What determines my responses? Them that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God, so that we may also be able to comfort, console, and encourage those who are what? In any kind of trouble and distress. In any kind of trouble or distress. You got that one friend that just... No, we don't. Because our friends will abandon us. They'll leave us. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But this is your responsibility. This is your accountability. This is what you were called for. This is what you're supposed to live for. To be able to bring comfort to your neighbor who lost their husband or lost their wife. Whose children, whose child just died, got murdered or overdosed. But we don't know how many times we get into a situation and we don't know what to say. You don't know what to say because you ain't got the word shut up inside of you. You don't comfort them because you come on the scene. You comfort them because you die like David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. When there's a demand on your anointing, the word of God to come flying out of you. And the scripture says in Romans chapter 15 verse 4 that we are comforted by the word of God itself. Not just comforted because you show up on the scene, but because you're full of the word, you're full of life, and you're bringing life to somebody that's in need of it. He says, we are able to comfort them. Who's the them? Romans chapter 15. Turn there. I want you to see that it's there and I want you to read it. I want you to learn it. I want you to realize it, that it's for you. It says, for whatever was thus written in former times are written for our instruction that we may be steadfast and patient endurance and the encouragement drawn from the scriptures we might hold to and cherish hope. My encouragement doesn't come from coming to church, although that's a part of it. My encouragement and my hope lies in the Word of God. Amen. That when I need encouragement, something down on the inside will draw it out of me and it will comfort me. Many men and women lose faith in God simply because their world was shattered. Tragic things happened. Many lose faith in God because they thought what they knew. They thought they believed. They thought they knew what they believed until a tragedy came. You thought you knew the power of God. They thought they had confidence in God. But when something happened, what they do? Fell apart, run back to what they knew. They didn't, think, they didn't know what they thought they knew. How many follow what I'm saying? One of the main things that causes us emotional bondage is tragic events. Tragedy happens. No matter who you are, you cannot do anything about it. It happens. John chapter 11. Martha says, Lord, if you've only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Isn't that the cry of men and women that experience tragedy? Where was God when this happened? The same place he was at when his son died on the cross of Calvary for our sins. He was sitting on the throne overseeing everything. Right. Nothing took him by surprise. The only thing that changed is you didn't believe what you thought you believed because if you believed what you thought you believed, you'd still be going forward even in the midst of tragedy. Amen. I can't tell you, I've been serving the Lord a long time and to see... You know, I can count on one hand how many faithful Christians, I mean faithful, that no matter what, they, they went forward. No matter what, they praised the Lord. No matter what, they did not give up or surrender. They kept going forward. They're far and few in between. That's why the Christian body is so flaky. Come on, somebody say amen. It's the truth anyhow. 
Our church, is, is, our church attendance is predicated by how we feel. Our, our, our giving is predicated about how well our finances are going. Our support is determined by how happy we are. But how about when you got nothing in you and you're still faithful? How about you don't have a song in you and you're still singing praises and nobody knows it's because it's your character? See, we're not free enough from our old character to develop the character of Christ. We're trying to integrate our emotional bondage, our troubles, our trials, our tribulations in with the character of Christ and it don't work. You got to let go of all your emotional baggage. Because it's destroying us. There was a man by the name of Ted Turner. How many know him? Know of him. He was a mogul. Millions of dollars. He was a self-proclaimed atheist. Tragic event made him. And he was raised in a Christian home. It was a Christian home. His sister died of, I believe it was lupus and suffered painfully and would cry to God that God would release him from this pain. He got so bitter and angry at God that he became an atheist after that. Charles Darwin was studying for the ministry. You know the guy who says we came from apes? At 40 years of age, he turned his back against God and lost hope in the scriptures because his daughter, 10-year-old daughter, died. Tragedy. Now you're sitting there and say, oh my God. You didn't experience a tragedy like that. But what's stopping you from going forward in God, fulfilling your calling? See, let me share something with you, saints. God did not call you to just sit in church. He did not call you just to occupy a chair in this, or a seat in this sanctuary for the next 20 or 30 years. He may have called you to be here for the next 20 or 30 years, but he, he called you to impact people in this church and out of this church. You can't do that when you're caught up with emotional bondage. I thank God for a pastor that I served at one time. Back to that, came back to the Lord, and again, all I wanted to do was sit there and, and, and support and give him what he needed because I didn't have it, and I, I knew what he needed. And he came to me, and he says, you know, God did not call you to just sit here, brother. I go, yeah, 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 I, yes, he did. I'm just here to support you. He goes, no, God called you to pastor. You need to get out, and you need to do it. Do you know what was keeping me from going out? My emotional bondage, my emotional baggage. I was hurt. I was misunderstood. I felt like a failure. Any failures here? Wrong answer. You are not a failure. That's part of our emotional baggage. Somebody told you you're stupid, you're fat, you're ugly, you're a failure, you'll never amount to nothing. You can believe that lie if you want to. But I refuse to accept those things. I'm not a failure. There's still hope in me. As long as I got breath, there's still hope. As long as I got the ability to walk and go forward, there's still hope. But tragic events stop us from going forward in God and fulfilling our calling because we like to sit down and lick our wounds and say nobody understands. Are you doing or are you go, supposed to do what God's called you to do for the praise of man? Or are you supposed to do it for God? Yes. Charles Darwin quit church, quit Christianity, and made a negative impact on it because of his hurt could no longer see or get the comfort from the scriptures because of his hurt. And I'm talking to men and women in the church that are, I want to say, having a sanctified high. You know what I mean by that? You're taking your medication and you're abusing them. You're abusing them because you're emotionally crippled and it makes you feel better. Can't nobody fix you emotionally like Jesus can. But it is a surrender. And as long as you live in that deluded lifestyle, you'll never find what you want. You'll never find what you need. And whatever you try to give somebody will, only be, will, 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 will just be a cheap imitation of the deliverance God has for them. Somebody needs you to get your deliverance so you can give them their deliverance. Well, I've been trying to get my deliverance for a long time. 
come out of the state of the tragedy you were in. I do not mean to minimize suffering, nor do I try to trivialize the pain that people may be in. But it's time to get over it. Because if you don't get over it, it will entrap you for the rest of your life. And you will never go forward and, and do anything of value for the kingdom of God. My mother died when I was 25, 26 years of age. It took about two years for her death to really settle in because she was uh, part of the Neptune Society and they picked her up and she didn't want a ceremony. She didn't want nothing. So four years of her absence and realized, hey, death settled in, right? But I want to share this with you. I didn't stop living when she died. Even in the realization, those of you that lost a loved one know what I mean when it settles in. All right? uh, uh, the realization of her death didn't cause me to quit living. Some of you are sitting here right now. Your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, a loved one, it could be a dog, a cat, a bird, died. And you can't go on with life because of that tragedy or that pain. The Bible says that we're able to comfort them with, that are in need of any comfort. He said in John chapter 14, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives I give unto you. He said the peace that he gives us, it passes all understanding and no man can take it away. I cannot explain or articulate in words how the peace of God can help you deal with the tra tragedies of life, but he can't help you deal with it if you're not willing to surrender it. Amen. Will you always miss them? Yeah. Yes. yes, you will always miss them. But do you have to mourn for them forever? No, the Bible says there's a time for mourning. You know what time means? A period. It's not an eternity. At some point in time, you've got to realize what the Scripture says. Life is for living. I need to start living. Amen. Tragedies stop us from living for God. It may not have been something so profound as a death. It could have been your uh, injustices that was put upon you. Fired unfairly from a job. You're accused and you didn't do it. Those things do happen. Right. People talking against you. Instead of releasing them, you imagine all this harm you could do in your head. Right? I used to have fun when I first got saved in my head with people. See, because I couldn't take them out. I couldn't hurt them. But man, in my heart, and my head, I was tearing them up. I knew it was wrong to take the action. Then I learned it was wrong to think that the action. That screwed me up. Because I thought I had found a loophole. <laughs> I found out what God wanted me to do was forgive them. Oh, my God. I didn't believe in forgiveness. Don't look at me. Some of you still don't. I didn't know how to forgive. So it wasn't that I didn't believe it. I didn't know it. But when I realized the power of forgiveness, I stopped allowing the tragic things in my life to hinder me from releasing people in my life and forgave them. Something may have happened to you in the church. Believe it or not, things happen in the church. Right? You try to do something, some well-meaning brother or sister, and I'm being facetious, but I say well-meaning, come up to you, go, oh, does a pastor know you're doing that? What authority do you have to do that? You ain't nobody. I've been here longer than you. Come on, talk to me. So you crawled in your shell, and you stopped coming out. You rob me, and you rob the person that is dependent upon you when you allowed that individual to shut you down. And that's what tragedy does. It shuts us down. We quit trying. So I'm just going to sit here. I'm not going to do nothing. Turn your Bibles over to 2 Samuel chapter 16. And we'll see a man by the name of Shammai that was of the house of Saul. And... David comes by and he says, is there anybody in the house of Saul that I could show favor to, that I could do something for him? 
Shemaiah was a member of the house of Saul and become so bitter and so angry because of the injustices that was brought upon his family. And he considered David was a murderer. He considered David as a thief. He came by and he robbed me of my birthright. I should be in the palace, but I'm not in the palace because he robbed me, this murderer robbed me of my birthright. Now, when you're full of pain, you do some stupid things. Or am I the only one? Imagine this. King David is riding in the countryside on his horse. And the Bible says he had mighty men of valor. You know what that meant? His soldiers knew how to fight. They knew how to, you know, that, one scripture tells us that one of his soldiers at one time had killed so many men, they had to pry his hands off the sword. That's a soldier. Now here's this man that's so caught up in his imaginary hurt. I want that word to sink into you. Imaginary hurt. Right? That he did something that was so stupid, but yet many of us are just as guilty of doing so stupid. Trained soldiers protecting David. Trained soldiers watching David. This man is going to sit on the hill and throw rocks at them. Makes absolutely no sense at all. But when you're in pain, your actions never make sense to you. You could justify them. You could explain them away, but they never make sense to you. Why are you still drinking? Because I'm hurt. Why are you still doing drugs? Because I'm hurt. You're killing yourself. It doesn't matter. I'm hurt. Somebody else may look at you and say, but you're full. It doesn't matter. That pain is causing you to drown your sorrow. He was drowned in his sorrow by throwing these rods, taking his life in his hands. I'm going to say, if I see somebody with a sword, with a knife or a gun, I'm not throwing a rock. I want something of equal or greater value. Unless a rock is all I got. Then I'm going to throw rocks all day long. <laughs> As the same it was. He's throwing rocks, and not only throwing rocks, but hurling accusations. See, when you're in pain, hurting somebody is not enough. You got to rub it in. But you're not going nowhere. You're stuck in that mode. You're stuck in that pain. You can't do what God called you to do, but you're going to make everybody else miserable. And you're going to speak things to them that you know penetrate their heart. If they're sensitive to being stupid, the first thing you're going to do is call them stupid. Come on, talk to me. Let's read chapter 16, verse 8. Actually, in verse 7. Shimei said, as he cursed, Get out of here, you man of bloody, you base fellow. He's talking to King David. The Lord um, avenged you. The Lord avenged him, rather. What he's saying is God's on his side. For all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose seed you have Reign, and the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hands of Absalom. Listen to this. He's blaming the dysfunctionalism in David's house on the fact that he wronged him. When you are emotionally distraught, you rejoice over the fact that bad things happen to the people you don't like. Ha! They deserved it! Their kid goes to jail. That's what they get messing with me. They don't know who they're messing with. I'm a child of the king. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Your son's against you because you killed Saul. You're a bloody man. All the destruction in your home is because you wronged us. Instead of graciously accepting what David was trying to do, bring goodness to him. He was so caught up in his bitterness, he couldn't see that. All he wanted to do was hurl accusations. Am I talking to anybody? Anybody ever tried to come to you and make reconciliation? And they're trying to tell you they're sorry? They're trying to tell you, look, I realize what I did was wrong. Let's Let's see what we could do to make it. Well, you should have never done that in the first place. I tried telling you, but no, you wouldn't listen to me. 
so caught up in your pain that you got to cram it down their throat when they're already coming to you to apologize. This is this example of what he was doing. You cut off the blessings because of your pain. Now, I know I've done that, and I know some people in here have done it too. The Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hands of Absalom, your son, because of the calamity is upon you, because you are a bloody man. Then said David is, David's nephew, uh, uh, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that, to the son of the king, why should this dead dog, listen to this, you talk about a man that's free from emotional pain? Listen, it was Saul that was chasing David. It was Saul that threw a javelin at David to kill him. And it was David that ushered in a spirit of peace whenever Saul was in trouble. It was Saul that swore to his death that he would kill David. Now, I don't know about you. If I'm loyal to somebody before and they turn on me, it's on. Okay, I'm going to get you before you get me. And I ain't going to tell you I'm going to get you. Just the fact that you threw that first javelin at me. But look at David. Saul threw three of them. Missed three times. Can you imagine the emotional baggage that was in David's head? What kind of punk am I? All these people who must think I'm a punk, he threw that javelin at me and I didn't reach, retaliate. He's over it. He goes back the second day. Guess what Saul does again? Throws a second one. Oh, forget these other people think I'm a punk. I feel like a punk now. Goes back the third day. Guess what happens? Does it again. Can you imagine how he had to feel as a man not defending himself? Get this in your spirit. Try to understand this. It does something to you as a man when you can't protect yourself or defend yourself. That's how they break your spirit when you're a prisoner of war. You can't do nothing. They just break you down. They break your spirit as a man. You just have to take it. David was an emotional wreck. Should have been. But he was emotionally sound because he knew the Lord was his helper. So when it came time for him to either bring retribution or to bring peace, he brought peace. We have two examples here. And David is the one that shines above them all because here's what he said. His servant says, why are you going to let this dead dog curse you? He's reminding him, he's telling him, hey, you're the king. You don't got to take this. I love David's response because he was so sound in his mind. He said, let him alone because you don't know. God may have told him to curse me to see my response. You know what David was saying? I'm not concerned how my soldiers view me. I'm not concerned my soldiers think I'm weak. I'm going to show him the power of love. Come on, talk to me. You can't show the power of love when you're emotionally sick because all you're concerned about is your pain. All you're concerned about is getting back. I know love to be a power force because it broke me. I was afraid of love. I'm not talking about an act of love. I'm talking about a life of love. I'm talking about acts of kindness expecting nothing in return. It, I was afraid of that because it was foreign to me. I can remember as a young juvenile on probation. I had a probation officer, and this is back, back in the 60s, we didn't have programs. You, you just, that was it. There was no programs. But I had a probation officer that took an interest in me, wanted to take me out on his boat, Wanted to take me fishing. Wanted to teach me to hunting. I'm raising the projects. Never had a man take interest in me. I thought he wanted me. <laughs> I'm dead serious. He scared me, man. You know, so every time he corrupts, no. I'd flex up, get tough. 
act as cholo as I could be, get them out of my house, get them away from me. But you see, that love scared me because I wasn't used to somebody giving me something, expecting nothing in return. And when you are sick emotionally, you can't give that kind of love. Nor can you receive that kind of love. It's foreign to you. David said, I'm going to exercise this because you don't know. Maybe God showed him this, told him to do this so that I can be a blessing to him. Tragic events cause us to stop in life. Tragic events cause us to question God, God, turn our back on God. Job was a man in the Bible, lost everything. He lost his wealth, he lost his children, he lost his cattle, he lost his uh, servants, he lost everything. Not only did he lose that, he lost the respect of his wife. Something's wrong with a man when he loses the respect of his wife. Something's wrong in a house when the wife can't honor the husband and the husband can't, ex- can't get the honor from her. So the Bible tells us as men to love our wives. Women need love. The Bible tells the wives to honor us because we thrive on honor. Woman, maybe you ain't getting what you want because you ain't honoring that man. Just a thought. Just a thought. I guarantee you the more you honor him, but he's got to be honorable to honor. Just a thought. Turn your Bibles to the book of Job, chapter 2. And how do you know you're not being honored? Because they attack. Amen. They attack. Listen to Job's wife's response to the tragedy. And then we're going to look at Job's response to the tragedy. See, notice this response is a choice. And that choice is usually triggered by your emotional wellness. If you're emotionally well, you'll respond appropriately. Right? If you're emotionally imbalanced, every time somebody says something to pull the trigger, what do you mean by that? Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Can't have a conversation without some people thinking you have a, an agenda or a hidden meaning. Right. They're problematic people that are emotionally bound. They have troubles. You can't work with them until they're free. The Bible says not to associate or be friendly with an angry man. Why is that? Because they're emotionally bound, they're emotionally troubled. Job's wife was unstable because Everything she had was the cause of her existence. She had children. That gave her worth. She had a husband. That gave her value. She had money, property, and things. That gave her authority or power. When those things were stripped away from her, that's why the Bible says life doesn't consist in what you have. You could strip a man of God with integrity and honor of everything and he would still adhere to his values to serving God because he knows without God he has nothing. He can always replace everything else, but without God he has nothing. But that can only be accepted and applied by a man or a woman that is emotionally free. My favorite scripture in the Bible is, is, is any one of them. But, <laughs> but this is one I quote often. It says, whom the Son is set free is free indeed. And we quote it all the time. And I hear people quote it all the time. And the people that I hear quote it, I say, you ain't free. There's no way. Man, look at your life. You're so sick. You're so troubled. Man, we never know when you're excited. Never know when. We never know what to expect from you from day to day. How do you know a man or a woman is emotionally free? Because they are consistently consistent. You don't have to call on them and wonder how their actions are going to be. You don't wonder how they're going to be the next time you see them. You don't wonder if they're going to be happy, they're going to be down, or they're going to be discouraged, they're going to turn on you, they're going to rejoice with you, they're going to hug you, they're going to slap you. You don't have to worry about that because they are the same. That's me. I am consistently consistent. If there's anything I'm inconsistent in, it's being consistent. 
I don't care what's going on in my life. I got, a, I got an attitude to praise him. It didn't happen overnight. I've learned to trust him. But that trust did not come without its challenges. I had to let God get in the corners of my heart where I didn't want nobody to go. And you do not know what exposure is until God gets in the heart and brings to your surface things you thought were hidden. Come on, talk to me. Things I thought nobody knew, even God. And he'd wake me up in the midnight hour in a prayer. He'd bring it to my spirit and tell me to bring it to him. I no, 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 no. Nobody's supposed to know about it. I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to think about that. It costs too much pain. That's why I'm living the way I am because I bury it so deep because the pain's hurting me. The pain's destroying me. The pain's robbing me of my life. And God says, I know that. That's why I want to give it to you so you have life. But you got to give it to me. Prior to my giving it to him, every tragic event in my life caused me to become worse. Am I talking to anybody? You get rejection from your family. Anybody ever get rejected from your family? Why can't you be like your brother? Why can't you be like your sister? They're always. You just don't know. Yeah. Those things are compounded in our life by our own problems. And normally this is the attitude that we get in life because we've not been comforted by God. Nor will we trust anybody enough to bring us the comfort. I shouldn't say that. People are not willing to face the challenges to bring you the comfort. The brother that led me to the Lord, I put him through some stuff because I didn't trust nobody. Nobody. This is the first man I've ever loved in my life. He led me to the Lord. For one year, I tested that man. Not knowingly. I had to know if I could trust him with me. Do you hear what I'm saying? I was sick. I was tormented in my mind. I was troubled by my own lack of empathy or compassion for mankind. And I knew there was something wrong with me, but I didn't know where to get it fixed. Am I talking to anybody? Now, the Christian church was saying they're coming, and, but do you think I was going to trust my emotions with the people I saw in church? They couldn't stop gossiping about one another. All they wanted to do was something juicy for me, and I wasn't giving it up. How many follow what I'm talking about? So I talked with this man. I worked with this man. I, you know, I... I I did everything with this man, and I realized, you know what? He's worthy of my trust. And I gave him just a little bit. And each time I gave him a little bit, he gave me something. I gave a little bit more, he gave me something more. I gave him a little bit more, he gave me something. Pretty soon I was walking in victory, and I was able to share with him my innermost, darkest secrets without embarrassment, shame, or fear of retribution or, re or rejection. He was an integral part of my deliverance an integral part, and it breaks my heart because I don't see men and women that are willing to pay the price to get people get delivered today. Right. Oh, you don't want nothing to do with me? Later for you. This man was consistent. He was persistent. He saw something in me nobody else saw. Why aren't you seeing something in somebody that nobody else sees? When I say God did not call you to just sit here, he called you to be a changer. To go right back out to where you came from, what you get filled and delivered to promote peace and deliverance to the people that came out of whatever circle you were in. Amen. I can't touch them, but you can. I'm limited, but if we all have that same authority, that same understanding, the same power, can you imagine what we could do? But tragedy happens, and what happens? We become like Job's wife. Chapter 2, verse 9. Why are you holding to your integrity? Isn't she saying? Fool, why are you holding on to God? Nothing, it's not worth it. Isn't that what happens when bad things happen? Isn't that how we feel? It don't pay to serve God. I've been coming to church for five years now. Look, my car got wrecked. Be a better driver. Blame God for everything. Curse God and die. You have nothing left. 
Are you going to maintain your righteousness? You have nothing to be righteous about. You lost everything. Curse God and die. That's a woman speaking out of her own bitterness. That happens to us. We speak out of our own bitterness when tragedy comes, when bad things happen. When you get caught for doing wrong, we still talk out of our own bitterness. If my dad was more than a sperm donor, I wouldn't be here. If my mother was a real woman and raised me like a mother, I wouldn't be here. You're stuck in your loss. You're stuck in your pain. Get over it. As I said when I started this series, I am well qualified to teach this sermon. Well qualified. I was given away when I was born. In the 1950s, you had, I think, up to one year to give away a child and get them back. The only reason I got back to my family is because somebody congratulated my grandmother and having a, grand, a grandson. My mother told her I was stillborn. I go on and on and on and on and on. There were some serious, deep-rooted mental issues within me. By the grace of God, I wasn't on, they didn't have psych medicine in the 60s. But they had all the other stuff. <laughs> and all the other stuff made me Okay. No, it didn't. It perverted my thinking. It perverted my mind. But by the grace of God, I'm not a marshmallow. And you know why I'm not a marshmallow? Let me, more importantly, let me share this to you. You know why you're not a marshmallow? Because God has his hand on you. He's got a calling for you. He's got a plan for you. He's got a purpose for you in life. Now, if he brought you out of that bondage, why are you going to allow the emotional dysfunctionalism, dis dysfunctionalism to stop you from going forward? Why don't you be like Job in Job chapter 1? This is what Job, Job said. He said, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. When they, they, said, when they, when, when they came and said, Job, everything has happened. And here's the thing. His, all, of, all of his cattle were killed. And while that one servant was speaking, another servant came behind him. Job, not just your cattle, but all the houses are down. And while that servant was speaking, another one came behind him. Job, not just your houses and your cattle, but all your children are slain. The Bible says he tore his clothes, he fell down, and he began to worship the Lord. Amen. A man that was free that realized, realized this one thing. His entire life, his entire purpose of being was to serve an almighty God. When you're emotionally free, that's what you understand, what you were saved for, what you were born for. I was not born to, to be a pastor. I was not born to be a husband. I was not born to be a, a, to, to be a father. I was born to serve God, everything, or serve God in his fullness, and everything else is a byproduct of serving him. Turn your Bibles over to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. In verse 13, all has been heard. The end of the matter is fear God, revere, worship him, knowing that he is and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This is the full original purpose of his creation, that you would serve and surrender him, but you can't do that when you're emotionally caught. That's why we got such sick, dysfunctional Christians. Some say you need to be baptized in Jesus' name. Some say you need to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Some say you need to speak in tongues. Some say you don't need to speak in tongues. Some say you got to have one leg, one, leg, one arm, and, 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 and crawl like a chicken to get into heaven. Because everybody's dysfunctional. Nobody's operating under the anointing of an almighty God. They're operating out of their own pain instead of doing what the Bible says. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28 says, come unto me. Come unto me, all the labor heavy laden. He says, I'll give you. He says, take my yoke and give me yours. We're trying to carry our burdens to the cross of Calvary. We're trying to carry our burdens to the, crown, to the cross. We're trying to carry our burdens into the throne room when he tells us to lay them down and learn of him. We're not learning of him. We're rehearsing the pain. We're rehearsing the memories. We're rehearsing the, the dysfunctionalism that was, put, that was put upon you, perpetuated upon you. Why not rehearse the deliverance? Why not rehearse the victory? That's what, that's what young David did when he went into battle and they wanted to put on some armor on him. He go, wait a minute, this don't fit me. He says, let me tell you what my God done for me. He started to rehearse about how good his God was. He said, a bear came, I tore the bear. A, a lion came, I tore the lion. He says, and who is this uncircumcised feeling? Philistine before me, but he shall come down. Why? Because he's defiling the army. Listen, it had nothing to do with him. 
had absolutely nothing to do with David. He said he's defiling the armies of the living God. He had a righteous cause. When's the last time? Don't, don't you dare talk about my child. When's the last time you had a righteous cause? Right. Somebody talking about your child is nothing. My God, we're like stupid mother hens. I'm serious. We'll defend and run to, run to the defense of our children, and they're probably wrong. Right. Let me tell you, you're a little mijito. Come on, amen. amen. Probably done something stupid, said something stupid. You come to their defense and show everybody how bad you are. You ain't even bad enough to make your child learn how to worship the Lord with you. Come on, somebody say Amen. You think coming to the house of God and lifting up your hands and ignoring your child? You're perpetuating, you're perpetuating your emotional sickness on them. The Bible says train. What does train mean? Teach, disciple, instruct, tell them. Show them by example, not just show them by example only. You better get up off that chair right now. You know, I'm just so emotionally bound, I ain't got time to mess with them right now. When they're 18 and out of church, you wish you did. When they're sitting in prison, you wish you did. I wish somebody could have corrected me when, they were, when, it was, when I was correctable. But there was nobody there to correct me when I was correctable because they were emotionally sick. And guess what happened? I took my emotionally sickness, my emotional sickness, and their emotional sickness. And each generation got worse. You look at the generations today, 14-year-old kids having kids. Thinking nothing wrong with taking pictures of a one-year-old baby with colors and guns and banners and, and, and money all around them. We're an emotionally sick society where people are calling evil good and good evil. And unless you become emotionally sound, and the scripture says, John 3, 2, above, I wish, brethren, I wish above all things you may prosper and be in good health. Listen to this. Even as your soul prospers. How do you know you have soul prosperity? How do you know you're emotionally sound? Because you realize life is not about just you. You have compassion for people. It was something foreign for me to have compassion. I thought people got what they deserved. And if they didn't, they were going to deserve it sooner or later, so it didn't matter. When's the last time you felt bad? When's the last time you kept some extra change in your pocket to give to somebody in case they asked you and it was cold outside? Come on, talk to me. When's the last time you went in your closet and found those 20 jackets you don't wear? I said, you know, why don't I put this in the trunk of my car in case I run across somebody with nothing? Talk to me. I remember one time, Wheels of Grace, we went out to, uh, um, went out to go feed on a Friday night. We were at the Oakland Auditorium, and it was raining. It was cold. And we pulled up, and we said, hey, we're here with food. Anybody hungry? And this man came out, just a T-shirt and a blanket. Somebody beat him up, took his pants, and took his shoes. We had shoes that fit him, we had pants that fit him, we had a jacket that fit him, and we had food for his belly. <laughs> Let me share something with you. This man went back to his little corner up there, touched by love. That could have been the changing point in his life. See, but there's a time when, you, when you're caught up with your emotional sickness, that don't mean nothing to you. It means absolutely nothing to you. Now I'm going to bring it home. We're in a drive for backpacks. We don't have a dozen of them. We have co community. We're living in a community, I should say. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but along Meekland Avenue, much of those workers are farm workers who make much of nothing 
to make sure you have lettuce, tomatoes, and everything else on your table. That have children that are going to a school that is one of the most undeveloped schools in the community. Whose children need what we have to offer them. And without compassion, guess what we do? Walk right by the backpacks and go get those nice pair of shoes you've been wanting. And you know why we buy what we don't need? It's comfort. Just like comfort food. Right? We are emotionally unstable, emotionally sick, emotionally bound, and something new makes us feel better. When I grew up, we had a school in the projects we lived in, so nobody knew we were poor because we, everybody, everybody else had flip-flop shoes, so it didn't mean nothing to us. Everybody else had clothes, so it didn't mean, I mean, holes in their clothes. Today, holes in your clothes, that blows my mind. I see these kids going to school, man, their jeans, and their, they were rags when we were kids, man, they, you know, and mom used to get those big blue patches and put them over, man. Yeah. We look like welfare recipients, man. Yeah, you know? so as I got saved, right? I got older. You know, I said, "That ain't gonna happen to me, man. I'm gonna have me some clothes, right? right. right? I'm gonna have me some things." Yeah. It was fulfilling emotional need, right. Right. right? I used to have a pair of shoes for every suit I owned, and after church, two services on Sundays, you'd see me on my porch shining my shoes for that night. You know what I'm saying? Nothing wrong with having nice things. I'm not saying that. Don't get me wrong. But what's your desire to have those nice things? See, my desire was it was filling that emptiness and that void and that hurt in me as a kid. In the fourth grade, going to school with two pairs of pants for the whole year. And they were both the same, believe it or not. Could not believe that. Think those things don't leave emotional scars? that I wasn't willing to surrender to God. It was easier to go out and, and, and go to Capwell's and buy a silk shirt for $75. Now, that was cheap at the time. Pure silk shirt. Oh, my God, it made you feel good. My body, but it did nothing for my psyche because I was still sick in my mind. You know where I learned all, all this? When I turned my back on God, I was in the pig pen. God met me in the pig pen. That's why I tell people all the time, man, chill out. Stop focusing on where somebody's at. God can meet them there. Just pray for them. Stop jamming correction down their throat. Stop telling people how to live. Stop telling somebody they shouldn't do this. You don't know what they should do. I had to do what I did to find God. And when I met God, listen to this. When I met God, I came to my senses. And I said, here I am, Lord. And the deliverance began. I realized my duty is to serve him. God did not call you, my friend, to just sit in this church and sing a song and take notes and put them in your Bible and put them on the shelf and, oh, what do I do with those notes? No. The world is looking for freedom. The world is looking for something of some substance. The world is looking for men and women that have genuine joy. See, I may not be happy all the time, but I got joy. Amen. Amen. I get pulled over by a cop, I get profiled, I lose my happiness real fast. So dude, you got your nerve, man. I want to say, look at me, but that don't work. <laughs> But I have my joy. And here's what happens. Because I have the joy, it turns it around. Yeah. Do you hear what I'm saying? We walk away and he's scratching his head and I'm laughing. I said, dude, you don't even know. My God had your heart in his hand. Right. <laughs> he turned you around. That couldn't happen if I did not have a sound mind. Here's what happens when you don't have a sound mind. You promote the curses in your life. You promote the curses on your life. Aren't you tired of doing that? One word, surrender. Say, Lord, here I am. 
I may not understand this 100%. I may not understand it 2%. But here I am. Show me. Paul put it like this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. So we're not talking about church attendance, church membership. I'm talking about a relationship with the living God, which is something nobody taught me in church. They told me, come to church. Get involved in the choir. Get involved with the youth. Do this, do that. A hammer and nail. Paint the wall. Go tell the world Jesus is coming soon. But nobody taught me, or I shouldn't say, the church didn't teach me to get into my prayer closet. The church didn't pr- teach me to learn how to pray for my deliverance. The church didn't teach me to learn how to be God-like. Right. And the churches, for the most part, aren't doing it. You know why? Because it requires change. And the last thing we want as human beings is to hear about change. Right. So we're willing to accept the change the church puts on us. Come to church three times a a week. Give your tithes. Change the way you dress. Don't go to lowrider shows. Sell your music. Don't smoke dope. Don't drink. Stop living. And just come to church. (laughs) And when they do that because they're going to church, guess what? All that stuff's still in the heart. And they start doing it in the closet. Then they start feeling condemned. Right? And then that taps into all the rest of their emotional bondage. Then before you know it, they're out there. I say, let them come in. Let them drink. Let them smoke their dope. Let them do what they want to do. And let them hear the word of God. And let God speak to their heart. Let God promote deliverance. That's what I love about pastor in this church. All right? We genuinely love people here. It doesn't matter if you fit our mode. It don't matter if you don't smell good. It don't matter if you just lit one up in the parking lot and think nobody can smell it because of the cologne you put on. (laughs) It don't matter. We believe this. We believe that if you keep coming, God will speak to your heart and he'll deliver you from the things that are causing you to do that. Did you learn anything this morning? Amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. We're going to continue with the series next week. Amen. And uh, what we're going to continue on finding out what causes us to be stuck. Because you can't get unstuck if you don't know what's causing you to be stuck. Right? right? If, you're, if, you're, you know, if you're stuck in the snow and you don't know the snow is causing you to be stuck, you keep spinning your wheels, guess what? You're not going nowhere. You're not going nowhere. So those of you that if you're here for the first time and you're used to, oh my God, we're going to have an altar call now. I'm going to lay my burdens down. I'm going to get changed. I'm going to get saved. I'm going to get delivered. No, you're not. You're going to walk out of here and become the same person you was when you walked up here. Amen. Because Amen. my prayer is not going to do much for you, nor there was your prayer going to do much for you. It's the word of God and God alone that's going to do it for you. We can pray the prayer of agreement. I believe that. I do not deny the power of prayer, but it's your expectations of the prayer that I question. Amen. 